Hi, my name is Stacy House and I'm the Child and Youth Program Director at the St. Jazz Native Friendship Centre. It's not really a program, I wouldn't say. I would say more of a, the way that we're moving now is more departmentalizing programs and services at the St. John's Nader Friendship Centre. So I'm responsible for the child and youth programs. More so child, youth and family, but um, I oversee all that. So the youth program, family resource and the child care centre. Really it's prenatal to about 24, I would say, NASC classifies youth up to the age 24. So within our family resource, we go from prenatal to five, and then our child care center, we include ages two to 12, and then our youth program is 13 up to 24. We try to make everything, any program, any service that we offer, we try to make sure it is developed within Indigenous lens. So that can mean a variety of things. For example, um, in Family Resource Program, we have a Parent Child Mother Goose Program. And a Parent Child Mother Goose Program is known throughout Canada. A lot of other Family Resource Centers offer it. It's about early literacy. It's where the parents come in with their young children and we learn songs, rhymes, um, stories, and we kind of just, you know, interact with our children from a very young age, singing, doing nursery rhymes, just being silly, but it's that communication, it's that um, connection with your child, and, you know, word development, literacy for children. So this program is very popular and it's very well known, but because we're an Indigenous organization and many of our participants are Indigenous or sometimes we have adopted children that are Indigenous with non-Indigenous parents or we have foster families with Indigenous babies, they come in and we try to change the context so it's not just, you know, your typical nursery rhyme or story that you can find online. We try to make sure that there's an indigenous component to it. So even though we might do silly bath time songs or you know lunch and songs or changing bum songs or whatever, we try to make sure that there's something with you know indigenous context as well. So we talk about you know frying moose in a nursery rhyme or uh, making bannock. And then for our songs, we usually start off with some easier songs but then towards the end it's every um, session every program is developed in 10 week blocks so we're on our third block right now so we started off slowly incorporating more indigenous and now we just taught them you know we did skin my ring the dink with gezalu which means i love you and migma instead of saying i love you we incorporate indigenous words and we just taught an eastern owl song for a parent child mother goose it's called a jimpa which means go to sleep so we're teaching our parents to connect with their children using indigenous culture indigenous language through these rhymes and songs and stories even when they're babies right so we just kind of it's such a simple thing, like it could be one word, it could be one song, but the babies are hearing it right from, you know, a couple months old. Like my son started when he was eight weeks and he's been in it and now he's 10 months and he's been going, he went to every single parent child mother goose session and he'll hear the drum and he loves it. He'll start drumming and like trying to sing as well. So, you know, it's just everything that we do, we try to offer it with an indig indigenous lens. Um, the stories as well. We make sure that the stories every time, because the stories are more so for the parents' enjoyment. Like they go and they learn their songs, their rhymes and their songs to their children. But at the end, it's just like a story so that the parents can sit back, relax and listen to a story. Because, you know, as adults, how often do you really get to listen to stories? So our family resource coordinator looks up indigenous stories and every week she tells, you know, the legend of the rabbit or the fox and she'll tell different indigenous stories like that and that's just one example for one program within family resource but there's many we have so many different examples in all of our programs that we offer we make sure that there is an indigenous component to it and it is offered with an indigenous lens we've been doing a lot of cultural presentations and i know that you know our cultural diversity training that is offered here it kind of 
grew from the presentations, I feel. Like, we started doing it geared towards children because, you know, every time a curriculum, usually in school, gets to grade five, a part of the curriculum is social studies, they, they do a chapter or a section on Aboriginal people. So we'll get a call from the school saying, oh, we're learning about Indigenous people and we just want to know if there's anyone in there that can come and do a presentation. It really started because there was a young girl that was getting picked on for being Indigenous and her parents reached out. We went in and offered a presentation and then a teacher told another teacher and then we started getting it every time they hit this chapter. So we would go in and we would talk about the four prominent Indigenous groups in Newfoundland and Labrador and it would be very informal and very much geared towards children and they would participate in drumming and singing and they, you know, they would be shown cultural items and they would be told the significance of these items and you know, so we started partnering with schools, um, local youth groups, other family resource centers, child care centers, um, you know, girl guide, guides and beavers and uh, cubs, all those programs that are for young children. Um, we started partnering with all these just so that they can have that early introduction to Indigenous culture in a, in a positive way, not just something through a textbook that they don't really grasp or get to experience. Being a part of the programs that we offer through the Friendship Center and just seeing how a young person can grow up and then gain that pride, especially if they didn't have pride when they first started coming here. And also a lot of other success stories come from parents and a lot of them, what are foster families and adopted families and stuff, like they're really, proud to have their children participate in programs and to learn something from a program that we offer and incorporate it in their home. Like just, you know, last week we have um, a drop-in play group and a family came in and um, they have uh, an adopted grandson and he was um, from Nova, I think. And, you know, they started just to see all of our indigenous stories and our books and they're like, wow, like, you know, these books are awesome. These are, these are great. Where did you get them? And we had a conversation. But then I was like, you know, you can borrow these. Like, we have a toy lending library through our family resource program. And any of the materials or resources that we have, you can take home. You know, you can read these stories at home. You can take these toys at home. You can, you can bring it all home and then bring it back whenever. And, and they did. And then the next time they came in, they were like, you know, oh, so-and-so loved this book and he could really relate to it and I'm glad that you know the pictures he said you know that one looked like me and you know it had people that he can relate to instead of just your typical non-indigenous books so I think you know those hearing those type of stories from parents about the children themselves is very uh, much a success in itself the land. Well, we try to as much as we can in downtown St. John's in the city, but I mean, um, we do whatever chance we get, right? Like, I mean, we had a Christmas party for families and children, and we had a Labrador tent set up on our front lawn with a fire, a, you know, tent still going, and an Inu elder Elizabeth Panashway inside making Inu donuts for all the children. And there was traffic in the background, cars, you know, probably sirens going up the street and everything, but it, it didn't matter, right? Like the focus was on her and that cultural just being outside. You know, we like to go off site as well as much as we can, go on hikes. And we just got back from a culture camp where we could spend time on the land and people learn how to set snares and skin rabbits and stuff like that. And we try to do as much of that as we can, even with the small babies, right? We try to get them outside, go on nature walks and talk about the importance of land and being connected with the land as much as we possibly can. And every opportunity that we have, we will take for sure. You know, we have wait lists so long for the childcare center. 
Our family resource program is very active for sure. We also have, um, we're a baby box distributor. So we have partnered with um, Baby Box University and they send us the safe sleeping kits. So we have a lot of contact with uh, pregnant women that come and get their baby boxes from us. So we connect with them right before they have their children and talk about our family resource program and our baby and me program, parent child mother goose program, drop and play group, like all these programs that we have within family resource. So we want to get them right from birth, right from um, prenatal stages. But um, I find after the child care center, like say after the kids age out after 12, they may come down 13, 14. The teenage years sometimes um, it's difficult to retain our numbers. If we have a big event, like you know, a couple years ago we did a YMCA youth exchange with another indigenous group, and that was great. That was wonderful. We had so many youth. You know, it was a it was a huge incentive to be to have a free trip and meet all these new friends. But then. You know, when our program gets slower, our numbers kind of drop again. So I think that it's, it's important to have um, that age group just to keep the numbers high there. So I would like to have higher numbers in that program for sure. Well, if money was no option like that, that's just, you know, that's it. Funding is always a limitation for sure, infrastructure. But our child care center, you know, we have a wait list right now. We originally were supposed to have infant care, but because of the number of regulations and the cost of construction for the mm -hmm. renovations that needed to be completed, we were unable to offer infant care, which was really unfortunate because infant care in this whole city is pretty much non-existent, and the ones that do exist have wait lists like so long you cannot and you know I myself from personal experience have experienced that and it's something that is largely needed so we would definitely have you know a bigger child care center more spaces so that more families are able to access child care infant spaces we would have um you know more staff so that so that they can offer those programs and services and we would be able to do things like culture camp more often. You know, maybe we can have our own location on the land, have our own program where families can go out and enjoy it. Like, it's all about fun. It really is. It really does come down to funding and the resources that you have. And without the funding, it's on. It's impossible to do exactly what you want. But yeah, definitely more childcare spaces. Um, infrastructure, a bigger building because we've really outgrown our space in more ways than one. Here at the Child Care Center, we, we've just, we are at our max capacity. We are pretty much stepping all over each other and, you know, there's six different programs operating out of one space and people need to try and communicate with each other so that, you know, when are you going to do this program so that we can offer the programs that are needed. But if we had the funding, then we'd be able to offer more for sure. And I think that um, there's a lot as well, you know, transportation is a big, is a huge barrier, like it's such a big barrier. And there was families, like I went to the culture camp and there was a mom and a daughter and um, they were Inuit and they loved it. And I, I was talking to the mom and I was like, you know, how come I, how come I haven't seen you before? She said that she's been living here since 2015. And she said, oh, you know, I live in St. John's, but um, not close to the Friendship Center, and I don't have a vehicle. And my daughter goes to Portugal Cove, so she's not always able to get back and forth. Transportation is a huge issue because we can only provide it within St. John's. And a lot of times when people move to Newfoundland, the cheaper rent is in Mount Pearl or Paradise or outside city limits, and we can't offer that transportation to our programs. So if we had more locations, it would be better if we had transportation to pick those up. Because there's, I know that there's so many Indigenous people like that mother and daughter that we're missing. Like they're not able to access all the programs and services that we offer because of those barriers, you know? So that's really unfortunate. And there's, like we have, thousands of contacts throughout the year but then yet there's so many people that I see and I'm like oh wow they're they're indigenous and I've never met them before I've never seen them through their friendship center 
I wonder why. And then when I actually talk to them, I find out that there's these barriers that unfortunately we're unable to overcome due to funding.